Okay, we're doing the thing. The thing. This is part two on Ezekiel's temple. Uh, we're going to cover a lot more than Ezekiel's temple, just as like an overarching picture. Um, due to some conversation we had after the videos were off last week, but um, lots of lots of fun. What do you? Okay. Uh, Student pop test, pop quiz, is that what they call? Pop quiz? Okay. Did do you remember anything about last week's? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Give me one. With Ezekiel's temple. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we taught on Ezekiel's temple. We also what about, about we talked about Tabernacle, we talked about Zerubbabel's temple, we talked about Ezekiel's temple, we talked about Herod's temple. Yes. Some temple stuff. Temple Some stuff. temple stuff. Yeah. Okay, any details? Yeah. You talked about cantilevers that I was going to, it's like that I wasn't, I wasn't entirely sure if the, if the, the text supported what you were describing by necessity. But. You're not an architect. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's like the, like, well, you were describing a particular, like, you know, I guess like one edge is aligned and then everything else coming off of it in greater lengths or whatever. Was wider, yes. But I don't, but at least what I was reading didn't seem to, I, I couldn't tell if it was, uh, well, again, like if, if one side was flat or it could have been like both sides, both sides like an upside down pyramid. Yeah. That's uh, what I saw in my head at first that it was an upside down pyramid. And then there was um, a diagram that it, that I was trying to find, like, see if anybody had made diagrams on it or whatever, and there mm -hmm. was one that had it where it was like, like you had the center, you know, like the middle building of the mm -hmm. temple, and then off to the side you had those rooms that, you know, it's like the, the flat side was on the outside, and then stuff, you know, like, more mm -hmm. like you described, but then I couldn't tell what would, it, it maybe it had even just been wall. Mm -hmm. Taking up the the empty space so that there actually wasn't any freestanding bits. The that would add, you know. the, uh, the drawings that depicted that particular thing they showed um, the wall facing the temple, which would be toward the inside. They showed it straight, and then the outside kept getting wider as you added a floor, uh, the three very, floors. It was very but that doesn't yeah. mean that's what it. That. Yeah, it was very difficult for me to find diagrams in the first place. So well, and that's just one upside down pagoda. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's just one particular upside part. Of, that's just one particular part of that's not the whole thing. Right. That's what I think what was called the chambers. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of um I mean we're gonna watch a video. We'll just say this. We're gonna watch a video where it is gonna actually show like piece by piece how it builds up. And it shows the dimensions really quick. It's not like a 20, 30 minute long video. I think it's like 12 at the most, maybe 8 to 12 minutes. But it shows the dimensions laid over on top of the actual rendering of the building. And, and it shows up in the corner where what chapter it came from. It might even show what verse it came from. I can't remember. But, um, but yeah, we're going to get a better picture if we make it that far. We're gonna get a, a video showing lots of detail. Another thing I remember is we talked for probably 15 minutes, maybe 20 of, about the lulav, the, uh, yeah. The palm frond? Palm frond, yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty decent amount of time. And what did the palm stand for? Like in hieroglyphs? Mirror, what? I believe, yeah. That's one of them, yeah. It, I had like three different. Freshness, new year. Um, yeah. And yeah, like by time. the time you get to our savior, king, the royalty. Yeah, let's throw that up there just because it's fun. That's that's a palm frond in Egyptian hieroglyphs. That means year. If you add the little boat or whatever that is, it means a, a certain time. And then if you get all fancy with the circle and the the little wings on the side, it means new year. So Rosh Hashanah in uh, on the Jewish calendar. Kind of like a new beginning. Yeah, or the return. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, 
So it's good that you remembered that. Because that was cool to me. Okay. All right. So what we're going to start on today, we were talking about, um, let me scroll up. We were talking about uh, some things God seems to be very concerned about, you know, with his architecture. And the first one we talked about was it's very geometric. You know, it's broad angles, squares, um, the use of the cantilevered floor. That would have been awesome had they done that because that means the Israelites could have taken credit for, you know, something we use all the time now, the principle of cantilever in architecture. And, but they didn't build it. They didn't build it. They don't, they don't get the bragging rights. So, another thing that, they, that he was, uh, he seemed to, with each different, uh, either the tabernacle or each temple, he seemed to fixate on certain um, decorations. And in Ezekiel's temple, it was the palm fronds, the palm trees. And uh, just in the sanctuary, and on, we're going to see a, a picture in a little bit, the cherubim, or the cherubim. But they have a very specific look to them. <laughs> And so we're going we're gonna to show pictures of it later on. But uh, then the, the thing that we were making it to was God seems to require purity or cleanliness in his dwelling place. And here we're actually just going to read the scripture because that, that does a really good job of describing it. So I'm going to start there. Hubby, will you read Ezekiel 44 verse 4? Sure. Four through, let me see if it goes through something else. Four through three. Four through three? No, that's backwards. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> it must be one through three. Why does it say Ezekiel four? Okay, read one through four if it makes sense. If okay. it doesn't stop at three. Okay, so one through three of Ezekiel 44? Yes. Then he brought me back by way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. Adonai said to me, This gate will remain shut, it will not be opened, and no one will go through it, because Adonai, the God of Israel, has gone through, the, through it. Therefore it is to be kept shut. Only the prince, since he is a prince, is to sit there to eat his meal before Adonai. He is to enter through the vestibule of the gate and leave the same way. I think that's probably where it stops. So that's three. No, yeah, that's the paragraph. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna correct mm -hmm. my paper. Okay, Cal. Mm -hmm. Chapter forty-four, verse ten through fourteen. Mm -hmm. Ten through fourteen, say you. Yes. But the Levites who went far from me, going astray from me after their idols, when Israel went astray, shall bear their punishment. They shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversights at the gates of the temple and ministering in the temple. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before the people to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity to the house of Israel, therefore I have sworn concerning them, declares the Lord God, and they shall bear their punishment. They shall not come near to me to serve me as priests, nor come near any of my holy things and the things that are most holy, but they shall bear their shame and the abominations that they have committed. Yet I will appoint them to keep charge of the temple, to do all its service and all that is to be done in it. Isn't it very interesting that even though the, the priests who did despicable things even though they returned to God and he forgave them, he still held them accountable for their sin. I mean, they still had to bear the consequences. Nowadays, we kind of expect not to have to pay the penalty of, or bear the consequences for something bad we've done simply because we've said, I'm sorry, or genuinely repented to God we still have to work out. Is that working out your salvation? 
Because you're not, saved, but you are working out the consequences of the things you've done. Well, you're not necessarily working out your salvation, but working through the problems that you yourself caused some time ago, maybe even. Mm -hmm. But those problems still have to be weeded through until you get get through that area area of life. Yeah, it so. doesn't sound like God put it put an end date. You know, he said the, the consequences of the, their sin would be that they did not get to uh, serve as priests in his presence. Well, yeah, they're not, they're not to be, well, there's a difference between a Kohen, a high priest, and a Levite. Right. That's always been. So he's, he's just having them work outside of the sanctuary. Right. Basically be like the cooks in a restaurant. Basically. They don't get to go out into the eating area yeah, in a restaurant. Well, I mean, once they go home or something, yeah, they're more like regular people. But while they're there, they just cook the meat. They're not to approach God in the Holy of Holies. Not even, sounds like not even in the holy place. Yeah, no. Yeah, it says, you know, don't touch holy or most holy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But that's just, you know, like, say you make a really big mistake sometime in your life, it's going to have its consequences. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, yeah, God may forgive you and all that sort of thing, but it's, you're going to have to work through those consequences until they're worked through, until they're no more. And so, yeah, there usually is an undetermined amount of time. Yeah. But I did note that it referred to, you know, that they'll keep charge to do all its service. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not sure what all its service we refer to, but mm -hmm. I mean, presumably to avoid complication, all its service, except these things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The high priest goes in, even in tabernacle days, he's the one that went into the holy place to do the things there and to the holy of holies. The regular Levites were out, well, basically cooking. But the high priest stuff just isn't counted in the you know, all that is to be done in it or whatever, yeah. all its services. Yeah, all that's to be done in it is everything. So But they said that it but it says But that, he can't there are things that he can't do. So Yeah, it says that you know, it's not all inclusive. All, yeah, it I guess it's just a little you know yeah, if I suppose just maybe if one takes it literally as I can yeah. it's like that it makes it a little awkward because it says you can't do these things, but mm -hmm. you're in charge of. But you need to do all its services and everything that's to be done in it. Yeah, so in my just, um, um, which is a complete Jewish Bible it says, "Yet I will put them in charge of the house and all its maintenance and everything to be done in it." Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, what the priests do for God, you know, bringing in things into His presence or you know, David Thomas, those sorts of things. It's just the upkeep of the campus, if you will. So, okay. Um, Mr. Richard, you want to read? Sure. Uh, verse 15 and 16 of Ezekiel 44. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the people of the Israel went astray from me shall come near to me to minister to me and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood declares the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary and they shall approach my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge. Yeah, good job. Um, way back at the beginning of Ezekiel somewhere and it was talking about the leaders who were uh, doing disgusting things that's the same people he's talking about here like they were pineapple on pizza. Yeah. <laughs> I love pineapple on pizza that would not be an offense yeah, to God not. <laughs> um, they have or God is calling them to repent and to 
be restored to relation into relationship with God, but the faithful, the ones who did not do, the leaders who did not do those disgusting practices, were the ones that were given the honor. Uh, it's not like the, the others were dishonored by maintenance of the house. They were privileged to even be that close. But the, the priests who remained faithful were given the gift of actually ministering directly to God. And you have to remember, coming down the pike here in a few chapters, the presence of God comes and enters this temple. That, that was the plan. You know, the vision was that once this is built, God himself would come and live in this temple. And so these people who are given the honor of ministering to him, they're ministering literally in the presence of God. And that's, that would be my belief. Yes. Being as we're talking about, you know, mistakes you make and you have to whittle through those in years to come. It's interesting here that it said, however, the Kohanim, that the high priesthood, who are Levites, the descendants of Zadok. Mm -hmm. Zadok was born along about the time, this time period. He was an honorable man, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I can understand this. But Zadok is where we get the term Sadducee. It's just, mm -hmm. that's, it's Tzadukim. But it comes down to us as Sadducee. Mm -hmm. So, and they were worse, by far, worse off than the Pharisees. The fair, half the Pharisees were quite honorable. The other half is what we hear about in Matthew. But the Tzadukim, or the, the Sadducees, started off with Mr. Tzadok, very honorable. But man, mm -hmm. did they ever go downhill. They were hanging their, their robes up in the towers of Antonio, showing their allegiance to Rome, not God. And so on and so forth. So by the time our Savior comes, he says to the, to the Pharisees, you're in danger of ill. In so many words, he says to the, to, the, to the Sadducees, he says to the Pharisees, you're in danger of ill. To the Sadducees, he says so, in so many words, you're going to hell. And he just didn't say it as bluntly as I just did. But he said it. Mm -hmm. Because they, they started off with an honorable man that he said, okay, you're the high priest now. And they just, so it's like, finally he sends his son, you know. <laughs> yep. So, okay. everybody um, else is going sorry. straight. Okay, number, no, what's that? Okay. Oh, we're going to talk about the, the, the clothing. Only linen, no wool, nothing that makes them sweat. Remove clothes in which they minister and lay them in the holy rooms. So, yeah. Um, Brian, right. verse 17 through 22, please. Okay. Not 22 through 17. <laughs> You're so funny. Once they enter the gates of the inner courtyard, they are to wear linen clothing. They are not to wear any wool while serving at the gates of the inner courtyard or inside it. They are to wear linen turbans on their heads and linen underclothes on their bodies. They are not to wear anything that makes them sweat. Before going out to the people in the outer courtyard, they are to remove the clothes in which they minister, lay them in the holy rooms, and put on other clothes so that they won't transmit holiness to the people by means of their clothing. They are not to shave their heads or let their hair grow long, but must keep their hair carefully trimmed. No Cohen is to drink wine when he enters the inner courtyard. They may not marry a widow or a divorcee, but must marry virgins descended from the house of Israel or a widow whose deceased husband was a Cohen. Okay, the thing that, I, we talked a little bit about this last week, the thing that jumped out to me about this particular batch of verses is that God is also concerned about transmitting holiness yeah, that was to the people. Okay, and I, I'm going to try to say this, and please 
my Baptocostal friends, don't take this wrong. You are not saved by works alone. You are not saved by faith alone. You are saved by the belief in Jesus Christ, and then you are made for works. They're planned for you to do. And so both have to happen or you're weak, okay? So we're going to like set that over here, and now I'm going to say something about this. A, uh, an individual that I am fond of listening to him speak uh, has this wonderful comment about unearned wisdom. How did I know that's who you were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Someday I will get to meet Jordan Peterson, but that's who that came from. Okay. And the principle, basically, I won't say it as well as he does, but the principle is you can learn something and you can think you're wise because you know this thing, you know this principle, but you haven't walked it out. You don't know how it really works in everyday life. And you didn't earn that wisdom. You just read it. Okay read it by all means, you know, get wisdom. But then the walking out of it, you earn that wisdom. You, you own the wisdom and it becomes something in your life that keeps you in a right place with God. I try to say it makes you safe, but as a Christian, you are not safe. Just get used to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> it shields you in a way. Okay? So, unearned wisdom will get you in trouble. Because you, you might try to step out in some sort of behavior that you think is wise, but you used it at the wrong time. You used that knowledge or wisdom at the wrong time. And you get mowed down. Okay. So, Unearned holiness seems to me would kick you in the pants as well because with holiness, there is a level of responsibility, right? It's just like with freedom, there's a responsibility to, uh, what is the word, steward that freedom. And if you do not steward it well, you will abuse it and end up hurting people, right? Okay, holiness, same way. Have you ever heard somebody say that uh, somebody used the word of God as, as a weapon against you? You know, like they, that you, you were hurting. I'll just give you an example. At one point, I was having a really tough time dealing with something. And a, a person who loves me very much quoted a scripture that was just insulting. I mean, it just, you know, she used it improperly and it just devastated me. It was an improper use of the word. There's an improper use of holiness. It's, it's almost like it would be too much for you. Well, you didn't know as Christians, were you Love hurting people. <laughs> yes, we love stabbing people <laughs> in the back. Yeah, people. talking about people. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, you, you mentioned three words, so I'll mention those three. Those three words. First, there are two types of wisdom mentioned in the Bible. Two different words. Two different spellings. One has to do with knowledge. That word is sakil. It also gives us the word for business sense, business savvy, siklut and so forth. This is the this is what Eve saw in the tree that she was not supposed to eat. She said, oh, that will make me wise. Right. She heard from the serpent, and she uses that word, knowledge and, you know. That's a business, perfect example. Of business savvy. Whereas the wisdom of God, such as the tree of life, that is mentioned in Proverbs, and he calls it by this kind of wisdom, is basically, it, God has to give it to you. You can't 
you can't earn it. You have to ask for it. And it's going to give you understanding of this book. It's going to give you understanding of fellow human beings. It's not going to give you business savvy per se. It's not going to give you knowledge of just anything per se, but it's going to give you understanding of God's ways. Well, holiness means set apart as in what the Bible calls us many times peculiar. If I take my peculiarness to just anybody out there, it's not going to go over well. You know, they have to want that. If they don't want it, I'm as if I'm shoving it on to them. Mm-hmm. If, if I'm shoving on You're my, violating their free will. I'm violating their free will and so forth. Exactly. So there's a lot of these things that are really um, some of the most important words in the Bible that we have to get from God alone. We have to ask him for it out of our own will. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. Well, and, and it, you can't... How do you say this? If the priests, through their irresponsibility, their violation of, you know, the, the pattern God set up, if they irresponsibly go out and transmit holiness to the people, unearned, unwarranted, um, they could damage them. They would both bear the, I'm, the priest could bear the responsibility, but the weight would be too much for the people. What is it when, um, okay, when Moses went up the mountain and came back down and his face, his mm-hmm. visage was so bright that people couldn't bear it. Mm-hmm. And he had to cover his face. Right. That's that was a sign of the holiness that he just walked in with God. And so when he came back down the mountain, he was transmitting holiness and it it was too much for the people. And if you truly love your people, you will not (laughs) you will not overburden them with something they're not ready for yet. Even if that's a good thing, holiness is a good thing, but too much, it's just like they go. <laughs> In more agreement with you. And what? Too much of a good thing. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. How often did you hear that, Phil? <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, on one hand, Ezekiel going out for a week among the people out of temple, he was a high priest. And he goes out there and he's completely silent for years, apparently. He doesn't say he opened his mouth until, what, chapter 35 or 6, you know. But that's not entirely bad because these people were bad enough, horrible enough to adopt all things about Babylon. And he goes out there and is freaked out in the first place because of the way they are, but probably wasn't entirely bad for him to become silent, at least for a time. Then he can begin Mm -hmm. speaking up. But... Mm -hmm. Because he he may have just run them off all the more. I mean, you got to choose your times and places. You know, you got to choose. You can't just blurt out anything. Well, you need to be listening very careful right. to God and to the Spirit to know when and how to speak. Yeah. So it's the same with transmitting holiness when that's just really too much. Okay, I'm sorry, Tom. I just made a thing about a Rolling K song. <laughs> which which Rolling K song? Was aptly called by my tongue. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's a good one. Sure. Okay, so the last verse, Adrian, looks like you get to read this one. Uh, verse twenty-three. This this is it in a nutshell. Okay, if we just had two seconds or thirty seconds to actually show why God is concerned with holiness and cleanness, this is what it would sound. Twenty-three to twenty-seven. Um, this just says 23, but if you feel like through 27 needs to be read, go for it. Uh, they're, they're to teach my people the difference between holy and common, and enable them to distinguish between clean and unclean. That's it. They're to teach us to discern the difference, to judge between those things, and to pay attention to them. Okay. We kind of touched on this um, last week, but I'm going to hit it again. 
just because it's very important. And I want, I don't know if I'll be able to explain it any better. And obviously you guys can um, run with me on this one, but there's a reason why all of these things happened, you know, at the time they did. Uh, this is one of the um, prayers that they do during, is it Rosh Hashanah? I can't remember, one of those. Mm -hmm. um, grant that we may see it in its rebuilding and rejoice in its perfecting. He's talking about Ezekiel's temple. Mm -hmm. This is Rashi. He was a rabbi. Very, very, uh, we'll say much loved rabbi. Yeah, Rashi is a synonym, or uh, whatever acronym, or Rabbi Shlomo Pitsaki, mm. I believe is the name, but it's whatever you call that when you just take the first letters of each word. And An acronym? acronym? Is it acronym type? I always try to say an acronym, and I have no idea what that is. That will be the opposite of acronym. <laughs> so, acronym. Okay, Rashi. If you want to look it up, you can. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to read this. What is the significance of this vision occurring during the year of Jubilee in that particular year? It's the year, like the year of Jubilee. Okay, we, we talked about this, the year of Jubilee. We know that the land, and that's, as you were fond of saying, capital L, land, you know, the land of Israel returns to its original owner. So no matter who you had leased it out to in that 49 years, on the 50th year, it goes back to you. So I guess that would be called a redistribution. I don't know. We'll call it a return. Yeah. So <laughs> sounds would, a little socialist there. So why would anyone ever buy that? I think you bought, the way I've heard it explained is you buy the use of that land. And then the land returns, itself returns to its original owner. So they know what year it is, what year it's going to, you know, the year of Jubilee is. Prorate. Yeah, they prorate it. And then they like negotiate. Like leasing the land, the original yeah. land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't ever, you can't ever purchase the land permanently. Mm -hmm. Right, and and when it says returns to its original owner, they, I think they really understood that the land belongs to God. God had claimed that land for Himself, and He was distributing it amongst His people, and so you were owner, but you couldn't sell it. You know, it it belonged to God. And I think it even says that in one of the prophets that you can't sell it because it, it's not yours to sell. It belongs to him. And I, and I think he chose that because if you really study it out, and you have to study this particular thing out pretty hard, land of Israel was once upon a time the Garden of Eden. So... There's a, there's a cool thought coming up about that that I was like, hmm. Okay, so we'll just keep going. All right. Um, okay, so the year of Jubilee has to do with land returning to its original owner. The particular year that Ezekiel was given this vision was, and the day, the 10th of Tishrei. I'm looking at Ron, and he's like, you're right, you're right, because I'm trying to say it right. Okay, the 10th of Tishrei, in this year of Jubilee that he received this vision, was also Rosh Hashanah, the new year, remember the hieroglyph, new year, the palm frond, the temple, he's got palms everywhere because he was trying to bring his people to an understanding of Repent for what you've done. Start over. It will be a new year for you. It will be a new uh, life for you without all the abominations and the um, putrid behaviors. So, Yom Kippur is the day on the Hebrew calendar where 
the entire nation analyzes themselves and if they need to repent of anything, they repent, but they also do it as a nation. So the nation of Israel would analyze what they've done, what they've been, and ask for God to cover that and give them a good new year. Okay, so this particular year's Rosh Hashanah occurred on the 10th of the month of Tishrei, same day as Yom Kippur, that doesn't normally happen. Um, something having to do with the law of return readings, that, that's one of the readings. Freedom from sin, okay. Do you want to read something for me? I'll try. Okay. Leviticus. Leviticus 25. I am making Verse 8 through 10. So Leviticus 25. Sorry, way back at the beginning. Yeah, making them turn to an entirely different part of the Bible? Yep, entirely different part of the Bible. Was it Genesis, Leviticus? Leviticus Genesis? 25, what? 25, 8 through 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. There you go. I got them all messed up. So much for knowing the Torah. Look at my page number here. That's all right. We'll let you. Tell you what, I've got stuff to read, so you keep looking. <clears throat> Freedom from sin. Okay. The purpose of. The Jubilee, Leviticus 25, chapter 25, mm -hmm. and then verses 8 through 10. This is going to talk about that freedom that you bear, you have to Sorry, be responsible verse, verse for. Verse 8? 8 through 10. 8 through 10. 10. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, go ahead. You are also to count off seven Sabbath of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years. For you shall sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound a horn all through your land. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all of its inhabitants. You shall be a, it shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. Good job. All right. In the um, complete Jewish Bible, I'm going, to, I'm going to read it to you in that one. It says, you are to count seven Shabbats of years, seven times seven years, that is 49 years. Then on the 10th day of the seventh month, which is Tishrei, right? Yes. On Yom Kippur, you are to sound a blast of the shofar, which is trumpet. You are to sound the shofar all through your land, and you are to consecrate the 50th year. Proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It will be a Yovel for you. You will return everyone to the land he owns, and everyone is to return to his family. Okay. I think what I'm trying to work through, maybe just in my own mind, is that God loves his people enough to inspire them to return and to be ashamed for what they've done and to repent and be restored to him, right? That's like the big reason for this Ezekiel Temple vision. Okay. I'm trying to narrow it down to my own life. How can I apply this to my life and in my circumstance? 
and I have family that I love so much. I would do anything biblically okay, to draw them back somehow to God, to me even, but to God. See them understand the damage they're doing to themselves, to repent, to accept God's forgiveness and humans' forgiveness, and be restored. And so the fact that God orchestrated one year, one vision, a Yom Kippur, and a Rosh Hashanah all on the same day. That certain time to see his people restored to him again. I just, I want that for us. I want that for, for anybody who has family, loved ones, whatever you want to call them, people that you are deeply caring about, return to God. Read this. Pray. Pray that God will do something like that for you and for the people that you love. Yes? We, whether we realize it or not, we are very, very much affected by the biblical calendar. We live under the Roman calendar, yes, or what we call the Western calendar. But we're very, very affected by the biblical calendar, which is a totally different calendar, but we're very affected by it. I'll give you, for instance, a young man, got a, this picture on my phone, that picture was taken, a young man in prayer, and after that prayer, well, I think anybody who knows who I'm talking about knows the history after that prayer. But that, I took a picture of that. And that was on the eve going into the month of Tammuz. Uh, yeah, we got the word Tammuz from Babylon, but Tammuz was a man, once upon a time, he was sexually astray, did whatever he wanted to sexually, and he became the figure of sexual, whatever you, you know, choose, particularly way on out there. Uncleanness. Yeah. And that's a month. That's a month on the biblical calendar now. And that was the day, the beginning of that month when that picture was taken. He didn't know. I didn't know. But I could go through so many examples of how we're affected by the biblical calendar, but because we don't know it, we don't realize it, so we just go on. I can remember a couple of years ago when my boss came in and he wasn't going to eat that day because he was fasting and praying that particular day. That particular day on the calendar was Elul the first. When you begin in Orthodox Judaism to fast and pray toward Yom Kippur, that's 40 days before Yom Kippur, to fast and pray for the nation of Israel, for the people of Israel, to repent. And he was doing it, although he had no clue that he was Which doing it. Which is good for him because he was listening to the exactly. Spirit. Exactly. He was listening to the Spirit who follows the biblical calendar. Whether mm -hmm. we realize that or not, but that's just it's the truth. I can't do anything about it. So, yeah. Yom Kippur <coughs> is the day that you can repent and be restored, or it's a day, if you don't repent and are restored, it's a day of judgment. It's otherwise called the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. And then following that is Sukkot, i.e. the kingdom. And 15 years ago, I could care, I would have cared less, couldn't have cared less mm -hmm. about the Hebrew calendar and the, the feasts that are laid out in the original covenant, covenant, you know, or what you call the Old Testament. And I didn't understand the patterns that God has set up 
and why the enemy hates that pattern. He hates anything God does because what God does is good. And for our health and safety and good keeping, and the enemy despises that. So for people who aren't aware of what's going on, the enemy is able to just mow you down on that day. Oh, you don't know you're supposed to, you know, analyze your life and, and repent on Yom Kippur. You don't know that. So guess what the enemy is going to use against you that day? Every sin you've ever done, every simple boo-boo to vicious lie, uh, the enemy will remind you of that that day and just bang you over the head with it. Where if you had known, oh, Yom Kippur, I'm supposed to do this for myself. I judge myself so that I will not be judged. And if I'm accepting responsibility for repenting and for self-correction, if I don't do it, something else will. And it won't be for your health. It will be for your harm. So... If you're wondering why is she talking about these dates, you know, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and why is she crying like a baby over it? It's because the calendar, the patterns, the deep pattern recognition. <laughs> I understand what God is saying to his people through architecture. It speaks to me. So, yes. But they had built this temple at that time? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I understand, we call that Rosh Hashanah, meaning beginning of the year. Bible calls it Yom Chura. Chura means the loud trumpet blast. trumpet blast. And that's all it talks about in Leviticus 23. That's on that day, it only says, blow that trumpet loud. And that's the only of the biblical holidays that happens on a new moon. And thus the rabbis called it a day that no one knows. Mm -hmm. Because you- Because it moves. Yeah, it moves. And so, yeah, that's the, it's the fall part of the festivals, mm -hmm. of, the, of the holidays, which is yet to come. Our Lord came and fulfilled the spring part. Mm -hmm. He's yet to fulfill the fall part. Rosh Hashanah or Yom Chirah is the day when he returns. Repentance follows. It has to follow. Otherwise, the kingdom doesn't come. The kingdom is Sukkot, a thousand year reign. Pardon me. So here he's calling on Zadok to be the high priest. He's setting it all up. I mean, it could be, the kingdom could be ushered in right here. Just all you got to do is accept God's calendar, accept his temple, accept his way, and the kingdom will come. This temple is yet to be built. But they, my, my. Just brilliant use of the English language. They went out. They went out, built a lesser thing. Yeah, they built something, but it wasn't this. Yeah, and it wasn't this, and so... You can have a calendar, but it's not this calendar. All right. I think we beat that horse long enough. Okay, we're, we're good. All right. So, now we are going to compare... We're going to get into the, the, the guts of the architecture. Compare the architecture of the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, uh -oh, Zerubbabel's temple, which was just a fancy upgrade to Solomon's temple. That's the one where they, they should have built Ezekiel's temple, but instead they just kind of did an upgrade on Solomon's temple instead. So, it is also called Herod's Temple. So, Zerubbabel's Temple was right after the Babylonian, uh, being freed from the Babylonian. The return. Ret the return. Thank you. That's the word. The return. And Herod just upgraded it a little bit. So, and then Ezekiel's vision of the temple that should have been built. And had it been built, like you said, the trumpet blast would have happened and the presence of God would have entered the temple and lived with men. And yeah. It's so. interesting that he it, he entered the tabernacle and he entered Solomon's temple, but he didn't enter into in, in any of the temples forward after that. Right. Yep. 
and there's good reason for that. All right, so we're going to start that bit, okay? And I'm hopefully, I don't know, this may go long, this may go short, depends on how much fun you guys are having. Okay, the temple, the tabernacle was really the first temple. It was just made with tent material um, and wood. Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple expansion and Ezekiel's unbuilt temple, okay? That is an, a representation of the tabernacle. And you're going to just prepare yourself. You're going to see something cool. Okay. This is Solomon's temple. That's Herod's or Zerubbabel's. Okay. Here he goes. Are you ready? Come on. Wait for it. <laughs> Guess who that is? Oh my. That was Ron at a younger age. <laughs> Holding the Ron did well, uh, tabernacle brown, tours. I have a brown beard. <laughs> <laughs> Ron did tabernacle. That's him too, believe it or not. He's little there, but uh this is actually the um life size replica of the tabernacle in Eureka Springs. It's called the New Holy Land. Um, Ron is actually taking a group, what day? September? Well, it's tentatively September 25th, I believe. 25th, if I'm yeah. If I'm not he's, mistaken. He's taking a group there. Um, called Grace Harbor. Called Grace Harbor. Uh, and yeah, it's going to give them a walking tour. He did that for years. For years. And so... Um, Every day for years. Several times a day for years. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna hit I'm gonna hit you with some uh, some details. Okay, God dwelt in a tent smaller than a regular house. Now, okay, look at size of human for scale, size of gate. Okay, um, this is not a huge space. God was more than happy to hang out there. The actual, I mean, we'll call that the yard. The actual building part. Yeah. 75 by 15. Mm -hmm. That's that's a in today's standards, that's a fairly small house. Yes. What are the sides again? How how's that converted? 75 by 15. The barn is our our barn dominion. Our barn was just a little bit smaller yeah, than that. 60 by 20. Yeah. Our barn house. That's where we live up until just recently. Um, and I'm still there. Okay, I digress. All right, so you have the brazen altar. Is that the brazen altar? Yeah, yeah that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. The laver, which is the little funny shaped thing right above it. And then the tabernacle itself, um, the holy place and the most holy place. And let me warn you, if you go, it's a really ugly priest in there. <laughs> ugly. <laughs> Statue <laughs> of a priest, and it's not Ron. <laughs> he doesn't look like a dog. He looks like a human, anyway. Mm. Not really. It looks like zombie from the apocalypse. Yeah. You know. So just be prepared. He's he's. he's yeah. I mean, he should have covered his face. <laughs> he should have covered his face. Okay. Uh, but anyway. Okay. So smaller than a regular house. It was open to all. Okay. Anybody could come in here, only the priests could go in there. Okay, but anybody could come in there. Uh, they were located in the center of their people. The tabernacle was surrounded on all sides by the people of God, the tribes were laid out. Okay, it was built with acacia wood, a hard and dense material resistant to water and pests. It was like the tree they had available to them in the Middle East at that time. And so that's the occasion with. Um, it was, new slide, very mobile. You could carry everything. What's that thing called? Well, that, that's something that very, very rarely spoken of in any book at all. But that's uh -huh. what we called them, the killing tables. That's where uh -huh. you, you put your, your you know, goat your your cow, your bull, or your little lamb. 
and you just close it in on them to take their life <coughs> before you slaughter them. Fun stuff. Barbecue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ark of the Covenant, brazen altar. Very simple. Okay. Um, the An altar is a nice Latin word. I use barbecue pit when I used to teach there. That's where I got it. Barbecue. Yeah. Why, why not? We, Tabernacle is the only place in the Bible where we still haven't translated things. The more the temple changes and matures, the more you see that it is about eating, about sharing a meal with the priest. Okay. Um, the tabernacle was in use for over 400 years until Solomon's temple was built. And God dwelt among his people with visible presence. Okay. I wish we had that now. So, all right. So we're going to go to Solomon's Simple. Okay. Are you ready? Jack, are you ready? No. Been Jack ready. is spinning in circles. He's so ready. <laughs> okay. Basic layout of Solomon's Temple. This is the flat version. There are no real images of Solomon's Temple. Um... Brazen altar, the, what they call the molten sea, that's the like a large labor, a large um, water basin. Okay, and then these five bits right here and the five bits up there are also labors. So this is where the priests wash their hands. <laughs> They do the thing. Okay, now, I don't know if any of you guys understand why the two pillars at the front of the court are called Jachin and Boaz, or Yahin and Roy. Do you know? I used to know, but I... We don't know. I can't remember. Tao, look it up. Okay, and while he's looking it up, we'll go on. Because I, I didn't have time to look that up. Okay, the cool thing that I learned today about Solomon's temple is bifold doors. The entry into the holy place was literally bifold doors. Granted, they were covered in gold, a little bit better than your closet doors, but they were bifold. So, kind of, you know, new appreciation for bifold doors. Well, be it tabernacle, Solomon's temple, whatever temple, the Hebrew word is house. Yes. So, you yeah, know, like it's, it's meant to be like a house. Oh, we, we, yeah. I remember a time when you'd go to go to church and you call it going to God's house sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or the house of God. So they didn't have French doors? No, no French doors. No. All right. So you have the holy place, tables of showbread. There were more tables of showbread and more menorahs. Probably because there was more people. I don't know. Altar Vincent's, that or Solomon was just on a roll. Um, the veil and the Ark of the Covenant, and that's the Holy of Holies. Okay, this is chambers, what they call chambers. Along there and along here. Mm -hmm. 30 of them. Woohoo! You have that in Ezekiel's temple, too. Mm hmm. You do have chambers. That's, that's the thing that we were talking about cantilevers on. Fine. Oh, okay. Hey, time for video. We're gonna watch this. Better make sure the volume's not. Uh, yeah, Brian, can you be prepared for volume on your end? I yep. can do mine. I'm gonna crank it up a little bit because mine's. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? Yep. <gasps> and it pops up over here. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hold on. First you got a Solomon's man. temple oh. stood in Jerusalem for almost 400 years. It was the crown jewel of Jerusalem and the center of worship to the Lord. Almost half of the Old Testament writings oh, took place. All right, here we go. Solomon's temple stood in Jerusalem for almost 400 years. It was the crown jewel of Jerusalem and the center of worship to the Lord. Almost half of the Old Testament writings took place during the time when Solomon's temple was still standing. 
Understanding the significance of its location, history, and design can greatly add to one's reverence for one of the most holy places in the world. The city of Jerusalem is located in an area of three major valleys, the Hinnom, the Central or Tyropian, and the Kidron Valley. The mountain range between the Central and Kidron Valley is called Mount Moriah. The peak of the mountain is a large protruding flat rock, which is now located under the Dome of the Rock. According to Genesis 22:2, Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac in the region of Moriah, connecting the Temple Mount with this significant event. At the time of King David, the area of Jerusalem was controlled by the Jebusites, the city only occupying the southern part of the central ridge. When David captured the city in about 1000 BC, he made Jerusalem his capital. David then moved the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and began preparations for building a permanent structure to replace the portable tabernacle of Moses that had been used for over 400 years. With the ancient city of Jerusalem being fairly small, David purchased the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite so he could expand the size of the city. Being higher than the city of David, the hilltop would make a beautiful place to build the temple of the Lord. Under the reign of David's son, King Solomon, the temple construction began. After seven years of construction in about 960 BC, Solomon finished building the temple, most likely built over the same protruding rock of Mount Moriah. Solomon also built himself a new palace just south of the temple and expanded the walls of the city up towards the peak of Mount Moriah. The Temple of Solomon was modeled after the Tabernacle of Moses. Because of the many similarities between the Tabernacle and the Garden of Eden, many scholars believe that the Garden of Eden was the prototype for the Tabernacle, and thus later temples. According to Jewish tradition, Eden was located on a hill, with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil at the center of the hill. The Bible teaches that when Adam and Eve transgressed and partook of the forbidden fruit, they were cast out towards the east. Cherubim and a flaming sword were then placed at the east entrance to prevent them from partaking of the tree of life, as they would then live forever in their sin. In order to return back into the presence of God, Israel had to symbolically retrace the steps of Adam and Eve, passing the cherubim and re-entering the garden in a westward direction. The tabernacle was set up in the same east-to-west progression, seeming to replicate the Garden of Eden. The tabernacle was divided into three main courts, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. The outer court represented the fallen world, while the inner courts represented a more sacred and holier way of life. In essence, as the priest, who represented all of Israel, progressed through the tabernacle, or temple, he left the world to enter a more holy state, and then was enabled to re-enter the presence of the Lord, passing the angels, or cherubim, who were embroidered on the veil. Solomon's temple replicated the same three-level progression, doubling the floor plan size of the tabernacle sanctuary for the temple structure. As one approached the Temple of Solomon, the first thing noticed was the brazen altar of sacrifice. The altar was 20 cubits long and wide and 10 cubits high, a cubit being the length from the elbow to the tip of the longest finger, or about one and a half feet. On the four corners of the altar were four horns, horns often representing power. This is where the sacrificial animals were burned, representing the future sacrifice of the Savior Jesus Christ. On the southeast side of the temple was the molten or brazen sea, which rested on the backs of 12 oxen, three pointing in each of the cardinal directions. In ancient times, oxen represented strength, and the number 12 often represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Water from the larger brazen sea was poured into ten bronze water basins on both sides of the temple, which could then be wheeled around the outer court for various washing and cleansing rituals by the priests. Around the south, west, and north sides of the temple were three floors of chambers or storage rooms. 
The inside wall of the chambers was stepped so as to create a ledge where the timbers of the floors could rest. The storage rooms were accessed by a door on the south side of the temple, with wooden ladders going up into each of the floors. At the front of the temple were two large bronze pillars that flanked the porch. The pillar on the left was named Boaz, and the pillar on the right was named Yaquim. The tops were decorated with lily flower petals and pomegranates. Pomegranates were a sign of prosperity and posterity because of their many seeds, and were also found on the bottom hem of the clothing of the high priest. The main temple doors were made of two large bifolding doors covered in gold with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. The Bible describes the door frame as being a fourth part of the wall, which most scholars believe means that the door had four stepped frames. The interior doorway of the Holy of Holies was similar, except having five frames instead of four. The priests who represented Israel were the only ones allowed into the inner temple. This means that Israel only could enter through being represented by the priests. Once you entered the main doors, you entered the holy place, a large room 40 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. The room was overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, possibly alluding to the beauty of the Garden of Eden. The room was lit by ten large menorahs, five on each side of the room, that were constantly burning, and narrow windows on each side of the top of the room. On the right side of the room was located the table of showbread, which had twelve large, flat, pita-like loaves. The priests ate and then replaced the showbread every Sabbath, similar to our weekly partaking of the communion or sacramental bread. Breaking bread and sharing a meal with someone in ancient times represented that you were at peace with them and was a sign of brotherhood, love, and forgiveness. Directly in front of the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. The altar was similar to the altar of sacrifice in that it had a square footprint and also had four horns, one on each of the corners. However, on the altar of sacrifice was burned the flesh of animals, while upon the altar of incense burned a sweet combination of incenses. The incense burning before the veil of the temple represented the prayers of the saints ascending to God before the veil, a reminder that before we can enter God's presence, our lives, prayers, and actions must become a sweet savor unto the Lord. Only the high priest was able to enter the Holy of Holies, and only on one day a year, the Day of Atonement, before entering, the high priest passed through a beautifully embroidered veil woven from purple, red, blue, and white threads. The colors were the same as used in the ephod and breastplate of the clothing of the high priest, minus the gold thread. Embroidered on the veil were cherubim, who symbolically guarded the dwelling place of God. As the high priest passed through the veil, he had to pass these angels, who, like in the Garden of Eden, guarded the way back to the presence of the Lord. Upon entering the Holy of Holies, you would find that the room is in the shape of a perfect cube, being 20 cubits wide, long, and tall. The walls were likewise overlaid with gold and decorated with cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Two large cherubim flanked the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the center of the room, with their wings stretching from one side of the room to the other. This room is where the presence of the Lord would dwell and represented the final goal and destiny of all Israel. Solomon's temple was not only a landmark for the city of Jerusalem, but more importantly, the dwelling place of the Lord. The layout represented Israel's progression back into God's presence and was designed to teach Israel that it was only through the infinite sacrifice of the sinless Messiah that they could once again enjoy the presence of the Lord. A sacrifice that would be performed on a cross only a short distance from this holy mountain. Okay. Rough overview. All right. Do you remember the 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 frames? 
on the on the walls. Let me find my mouse. There you are. You know I love archaeology. Okay. Do you remember the where it said it had four frames or five frames? Mm -hmm. um, this is. A proposed reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem based on the stone model shrine discovered at Kirbet Kirgata. I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyway, so these are actually pieces of um, temple service utensils and then um, a model of that door. I'd like to see that in person. Anyway, okay. It'll be really short to get through that door. Mm -hmm. All right, so. The Jewish people were short. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go back. Oh, she back one. All right, so um, just um, brief statements on Solomon's Temple. Lar it's larger than and based off of the tabernacle pattern. You heard that. Stepped chambers, Tao, did you notice? The step was the opposite mm -hmm. direction. It was back toward the wall yeah. instead of Well, yeah, that's, that's what the diagram that I had seen was like. That Solomon's temple is that way. Um, it's uh, more ornate. I'm sure you figured that out. The cherub and the palm and the open flowers, which they think are lotus leaves. Uh, gold leaf. <coughs> um, Egyptian influence. <laughs> yes. Did you notice? I mean, they. I. Yeah, they, they have the the chir the big cherubim looking like sphinxes. Yeah, looking like sphinxes. Yeah, I noticed that too. And yeah, I obviously there are some influences that had to come from Egypt. Yeah. With the Israelites, it just had to. I just don't know how much. So it, obviously that was. Um, and depending artistic on, rendering, we'll say. And I imagine also depending on your, you know, there are all manner of different schools of thought on Solomon. And so, you know, depending yes. on what you think <clears throat> there, you know, the Egyptian influence could be more or less. Or, well, you know, we don't necessarily true. know what uh, cherub or, or mm -hmm. any of the these particular creatures. Yeah, yeah, like. Angel is a nice general term, but the particular types, we don't necessarily... We just know they have wings. Yeah. Some of them have two faces. And the way Ezekiel describes them, it sounds like, well, in ancient days you call it chariot, nowadays you call it an automobile. But the way he describes it, it sounds something like that, you know? Yeah. The, the whole, at least God's presence anyway, with cherubs on it. Mm -hmm. But oh, and by the way, this guy just says the presence of the Lord, mm -hmm. that was fire that you yeah. could see for a long way. Mm -hmm. Yep. In both tabernacle and temple. Yep. Real actual fire. Mm-hmm. I agree. That the high priest walked into. Did it ever hit the <clears throat> rubble bulls or Herod's temple? No. Okay. There's a reason. Um, okay. Mm, the wood cedar from Lebanon used in the construction with gold overlay. Okay. I just want you to notice the different types of wood for each building. Uh, the cherubim guarding the entry to the most holy place, similar to the cherubim guarding Eden, which they showed that. I thought that's pretty cool. Um, and it's very vertical. It's a bit intimidating. And man looking to the heavens for Messiah. We were talking about that a little bit last week. Um, if you'll just pay attention to the nature of the architecture of the tabernacle, very much with his people, um, moves with his people. His people follow him wherever he goes. Uh, Solomon's temple, very big, very imposing. Not that it was wrong, but it, the vertical architecture and just, you know, the impressive nature of those, of cherubim with Wingtips literally touching each wall, so 20 cubits wide. That's that's a pretty big cherubim. Um, and granted, not very many people got to see that part, but they were Solomon was trying to do something with his architecture, and he was trying to, it seemed to me, display the majesty of God. You know, the he's up there. Um, we must revere him. 
it wasn't quite so much I am with them on the same level. You know, I'm still God, but I'm on the level with these other people, which Ezekiel's temple does have that. So, okay, time-wise, what are we doing? Do I need to stop there, or do, do I want to hit Zerubbabel's and then hold Ezekiel's temple to next week? We're not going to be here next week. What do you want me to do? Uh, you've been at it for just short of an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. And you can hit Zerubbabel's. I don't know how, how much that... I don't have a video for Zerubbabel's. I just got words, and they're not very nice. So let's <laughs> let's do Zerubbabel's really quick. Okay. Okay. This... Come on. Zerubbabel's expansion of Solomon's temple after the Babylonian captivity. And this is also called Herod's temple. Okay, they come back from Babylonian captivity. They bring back Babylonian culture, Babylonian segregation. I'm just going to read the list of things they add. It's even larger and based off Solomon's temple. It's, it's an upgrade on Solomon's temple with a smash up of Babylonian segregation. They added a chamber of oils. They added a chamber of the Nazarites. They added a chamber of wood. They added a separate chamber for lepers. They added a gate of Nicanor, and I didn't have time to study that, but I don't know why that's there. And then obviously the one that is um, most offensive to me is they added a, a women's courtyard, and that wasn't because they were being nice. It's because they were segregating the women away from the men and segregating the lepers away from... Uh, Obviously, you want to say, okay, well, that one at least makes sense because they were very, very contagious. Okay, but why are they at the temple? There's, they, they need to be healed, not isolated. So, I don't want to go any further on that one. Um, and it's even more vertical and ornate. So, there you go. Court of Women. Do you see it? Okay, and then the gate called Beautiful. That's this one in the center, the Golden Gate, um, Solomon's Portico. When I saw that, I'm like, hey, that's Hanukkah right there, because on Hanukkah, Jesus was right there walking the portico. So, and talking. Uh, Court of the Gentiles separated the Gentiles. I mean, this is like segregation gone to seed. I'm not happy. Okay. And Gentiles, and, that's big. Yes. <laughs> so you do. And the when you when we you spoke earlier of the Antonio's fortress, that's mm -hmm. it right over there on that corner. So yes, you have something to say. Well, one of the differences in Herod's temple that was not in anything else, he had to the Holy of Holies a foot and a half veil. Oh yeah. You might as well call it a wall. Because no one could possibly go through it. Mm -hmm. would, no one entered the Holy of Holies in Herod's Temple because you couldn't get through that wall. And all in everything else, there was a split. It's just a sheet, and the sheet was two sheets actually, providing mm -hmm. a split in the middle, as God commanded, mm -hmm. and very simple. Well, what did our Lord do when He said finished? Split that thing. Split right. it down the middle from top to bottom. Yeah, made it the way it was actually supposed to be biblical. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and um, the presence of God did not enter this temple. Right. It, it's because man was doing man's own thing, not God's. He didn't follow the pattern God set out, and God does not honor that. So, okay, this, we're going to do Ezekiel's temple. We'll probably, it, we're, unless we're having somewhere else we talked about having uh, next week at the little house and so we might still do this next week but if not it'll be the week after but the next part will be Ezekiel's temple and either I, we could either do the little house or um Workman's no um um Creek, Eugene and Janae's house possibly we'll figure it out and let everybody know but Okay, just so you know what's going on, this always helps me. We're gonna look at the timeline and then we're, we're gonna call it quits for today. All right. 
1250 BC, Moses receives instructions for the tabernacle. Okay. Then you have all these little temples. Shechem, Shiloh, I can't even pronounce that one, Gideon Temple. Okay, King David captures Jerusalem, 1000 BC. Then Solomon's temple was constructed in 968 BC. Okay, so that's what that's representing. Uh, the kingdom of Israel splits in 930. That's called the first temple period. Okay. Um, the, you have the different reforms that happens in the temple, and Josiah is like one of my favorite. Okay, the destruction of Solomon's temple by Nebuchadnezzar was 586 BC. Then you have Ezekiel, okay, and the Babylonian exile. So at 600 BC, give or take some, um, well, 586 is Babylonian exile. We'll just leave it at that general numbers. This is when they get out of the exile, when they come back, they return. 515 BC, Zerubbabel's reconstruction of Solomon's temple with his horrible segregating attitude. Okay, um, bad architect. Uh, then you have the Elephantine Egypt temple. What is that? I haven't gotten to study that yet. Okay, so then you have like the Book of Malachi is hanging out in there. It's kind of showing you the lead up to Jesus, okay? Um, Hanukkah is the 175 to 164 B.C., the Hellenistic Ptolemaic rule, okay? Hanukkah, yay. Back to begin revolt. And then Jesus, yay! And then Zerubbabel's temple was dismantled and replaced by Herod's temple. I don't understand that part. Maybe I will soon, but... And then Herod's temple destroyed by the Romans, AD 70. There you go. So we will start there with Ezekiel and the vision of Ezekiel's temple the next time. Okay, let's pray. Let's go home. Jesus, um... We're so glad that you came in the flesh so that we could be the temple. Each individual could be the temple. And we could worship without segregation, without, um, thankfully, without violation of free will. I'm very thankful that you that you love your people and that you will call them to return over and over and over again without fail. You are a good God. In Jesus' name, amen.